name is Mark Doty, and I am a product specialist at Ookla USA, uh, which is a bit interesting because, uh, as some of you might know, my history was not in the Ookla direction. Uh, for half a decade, I was the um, education and archive specialist for the Bob Moog Foundation, and uh, so coming to Ookla was a completely new experience for me from you know, the obvious differences between the two legacies. <clears throat> so in this process of transitioning, it was kind of a, a shock to be asked to uh, work for Bukla, especially as a historian, as I originally was asked. And it was like, oh, because yeah, I don't have any of that history. And it turned out that no one did. So that was, uh, that was good. But, um, so when I was hired by the Bob Moe Foundation, I was delivered to a, basically a vault of incredible information. The Bob Moe archives were so specific and so full of information. He kept incredible records, incredible documents, just uh, everything you would need to know about Bob's legacy was in his archives. And so it was basically just down to me to start studying which was fantastic. Uh, when I was asked to be a historian at Buchla, I arrived at Buchla and found that there was nothing. There were no documents. Uh, many of the things that belonged to Don went directly to his family, which we don't have access to. And the rest of the fantastic Buchla documents that exist out in the world are held by individuals who jealously guard them and protect them. So it becomes the thing that I think people do on the internet too much, which is just hunting around the internet trying to find bits of information. As a person who has been taken part in that process and has talked to a lot of people, um, I recognize that there, the internet has this ability to take fact and history and mold it to suit certain narratives. And there's been a lot of that going on. And I spent a lot of time at the Bob Moog Foundation trying to like harness people's viewpoints back to what is actually true. And I can kind of see, based on so much of the synthesizer culture right now on the internet, there's a mythology that is burgeoning around Bukla, which sort of makes it difficult to get to the actual facts of history. So, uh, with the small amount of information I've been able to discover in my year and a half at Bukla, um, I've started to recognize trends of ideas that help people understand how Bukla, the, the Bukla brand came about and what Don was actually doing. And so basically this presentation is me sort of for, like reframing the narrative back to how it historically happened as opposed to how it is culturally perceived right now. So that's what I'm gonna do. <clears throat> First, I would like to start with a little history lesson because so many people want to start immediately with Don's creation of his instrument, um, but there is a huge background that leads up to that creation that is crucial to understanding why that creation took place. So Ferruccio Bassoni, uh, the guy who is on the left, uh, wrote a book in 1907 called The New Aesthetic of Music. And it was crucial because it described how 19th century composers were sick of 19th century music and really wanted to progress into new styles of music that explored a lot of the new technology that was coming about at the time. There was that new excitement that was felt by everyone at the turn of that century, the turn of the 20th century, where artists, and especially composers, wanted to move into new styles of expression. And that is a crucial, crucial idea, new styles of expression. All the instruments that were in the orchestra, everyone had been using them for years. They were no longer interesting to composers because composers felt that with the new technological, technological developments, there was something big on the horizon for creating music. 
And so there were a lot of different movements. Uh, the futurists, of which Usoni sort of started, really wanted to develop a new context of music, new instruments, and new ways of creating music that weren't based on what had historically happened. Edgar Varez, the gentleman next to him, picked up this idea and ran with it and really wanted the future of music to go in a technological direction for the purpose of the composer having control over not only performance, but also timbre, which was a new concept outside of the pipe organ, of course. So he specifically stated that there is a new future of music out there and engineers and composers are going to have to work together to arrive at it, which is fantastic because in both legacies, engineers and composers work together for new technology. So in 1948, this gentleman uh, started to propose a new style of music that was possible due to recording technology where it was a celebration of the accomplishments of humankind, the technological accomplishments of humankind, and sound in general, and that was musique concrète, which is the process of using found sound, sounds that exist in nature, sounds created by humans, and arranging them in expressive ways. On, well, it started off on a uh, lacquer disc, but it moved to tape and tape proved a relatively decent medium for this because you could record sounds and then you could rearrange the tape to arrange the sounds in whatever way you might like. So this was a huge, huge step in the process of creating a new style of music in that it provided a procedure and a context within which new music could be created. Other uh, various uh, Composers were working on means of using the new devices that could create new timbres and finding ways to arrange those timbres that were new and not in reference to traditional 19th century music. Uh, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, whom I'm sure you've all heard of a million times, uh, the cool thing about these people is they really took the two disciplines, uh, Musique Concrète from France and Electronische Musik from Germany, which were two different sort of approaches to electronic music, uh, both of which using various components to create the music. But in the case of Germany, it was electronic sound. In the case of France, it was recorded sound. But these two basically come together in what the BBC Radiophonic Workshop was doing, which was recording sounds, electronic or otherwise, and then splicing, like cutting the tape up, splicing the bits together to create new music. Now, if you can imagine, I don't know, a lot of you have probably worked with tape before, <laughs> and that process is complex and horrific and really not very musical in the sense that it's so procedural. When you're sitting there chopping the tape up, you're not expressing yourself, the expression is coming from what you will then make, which is a step away from sort of a musical experience. And that was the worst part of electronic music, was that to do electronic music, there wasn't the technology to allow the composer to simultaneously experience their own composition as they were creating it, like you could if you were composing on a piano or a violin or anything else. There were a lot of steps and a lot of procedures to go through before you were able to do this. And this is typified also by the RCA Mark II in you know, creating the punch card, which is such a mathematical process that doesn't have to do with personal expression. So, Don Buchla was born in Southgate, California in 1937, and um, he had a childhood where he was immediately interested in the new electronic uh, process and also musical instruments. He played piano as a child and later at one point taught himself flamenco guitar. So he, he was a person who had experiences with uh, actual physical musical instruments. And um, in 1955 through 1959, he went to UC Berkeley. 
You studied physics primarily, but also studied music. Um, he graduated with a physics degree in 1959. After that, he started working on a graduate program and worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Natural Laboratory, uh, University of California's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. It had one of the first particle accelerators, and Don started to help with that in building klystrons, which are devices for building high-frequency electric fields that accelerate particles. So, you know, I, I don't have one. But uh, <laughs> I had to actually look it up. And so this is what a klystron looks like. Yeah, I, I did not go to uh, college for physics. So yeah, apparently this makes particles go faster, in case you want one. In addition to that, he also did some work with NASA, sort of uh, research. Um, he studied the Van Allen belt and its effects. Uh, he also did a feasibility study about sending chimps to Venus. Apparently, it wasn't really a viable option at the time. You know, now we could, you know, we look back and laugh because you know, sending chimps to Venus all the time. But you know, uh, he did he did have involvement Don Buchla with NASA, which is really interesting. Um, of course, this was sort of getting into the era of civil rights, and um, because the students who were working on these sort of high-level technological developments, I mean, there was the possibility of security issues, uh, there was a move by the school to sort of limit their ability to talk about what they were doing. And in the midst of the civil rights era, this was a bit too restrictive for some, including Don. So he actually left the school and started to pursue his own interests. One of the things that he pursued was a very novel concept of creating an electronic music device that generated sound based on the shape of your hand. Uh, it had motor-driven motor -driven scanning wheels on two axes, time and amplitude, and by moving your hand around, you could actually create different waveforms. Um, now, of course, these waveforms were static frequencies because the, this was the era of electronic music where you made a frequency and then you recorded it on tape and then you spliced the tape together to get, for example, the melody or sequence of notes that you would want. And this becomes really relevant shortly, but obviously you invent this, the synthesis device to read your hand shape, and then you still have to go through the tedious process of cutting up tape in order to create a composition out of it. Um, Don also began work, as many did, in transistors, which at that time were the new thing. And right there at the beginning of the 60s, transistors had been around long enough that their price started to go down and they became an inexpensive and effective, convenient way of making electronic devices as opposed to using tubes. And so those who were fluent in the new transistor technology were the people who were likely to be uh, capable of creating new technology with that transistor technology. Uh, the same thing was sort of true of Bob Moog when he moved from doing tube-based theremins to transistorized theremins in the late 50s. Um, also, uh, Don started to design miniaturized amplifiers for a variety of uses and that he found very interesting, but unfortunately, the FBI thought that was a really interesting idea, and Don, feeling as he did about things like the FBI, decided that he would rather not make those than have the FBI use them. So uh, he moved away from the creation of miniature amplifiers. Um, between 1961 and 1965, he conducted independent research in regard to electronics and prosthetics, which is really interesting if you know uh, what Don was in interested in later in life. It was very, he was very interested in the, in the human machine interface 
how humans using this new technology would interface with that technology. And the combination of a variety of these things that he was interested in, transistors, um, the technological processes that he had, and certainly this unique interaction uh, between the human body and machines uh, really demonstrates his interest, his future interest in creating devices that humans interact with. Incidentally, this picture is from Star Wars. <laughs> well, you, you know, Star Wars, the Empire, Star, the Empire Strikes Back Wars. I guess. <laughs> anyway. Here is a massive deficit in this presentation. Um, one of them, actually. But uh, <laughs> apparently, and I only found this anecdotally and I found no uh, photographic evidence of it, but apparently Don was interested, he, was, he created a number of metal uh, sculptures that also employed strings, so they were basically musical instrument sculptures using strings. Uh, so he was also in the process of creating physical musical instruments as, uh, as all of the things that we're talking about right now were coming together. So I want you to imagine a metal sculpture sort of string instrument. I don't have any further information than that. But it's interesting, and I will continuously do this, and it'll probably become tedious, but there's also a parallel between uh, Don and Bob. Bob, one of Bob's early exposures to electronic, the movement of electronic music was with Jason Seeley's metal uh, sculptures that created interesting sounds. So there's just a weird metal sculpture connection there. Um, in 1964 and 1965, uh, Don was doing experiments with LiDAR and came up with this device, which is called the Orb, optical ranging for the blind. Basically, it was a device that sensed the environment and the, the user, a blind person, would use it like a flashlight. And because of how the LiDAR worked, it could indicate through frequency uh, the proximity of objects. So again, Don was really fascinated with the idea of creating technology that allowed a human interaction with that technology for an outcome. Uh, <clears throat> of course, when Don was at Berkeley, he was exposed to the electronic music movement, which I often want to stress to people. Uh, in this day and age, so many people think of electronic music as simply music made with electronic devices, or more specifically, music made with synthesizers only. And when you say electronic music, that's what people think of, things like EDM, etc. But what seems to be somewhat forgotten is the fact that there was an electronic music movement, which is the one that I was describing at the beginning of, where there was a, an array of composers who followed specific procedures for specific outcomes. And that was uh, electronic music, capital E, capital N. Of course, it was largely inaccessible to audiences, but still, it's a thing that happened. And um, so when Don was in college, he was exposed to this, this electronic, the burgeoning electronic music movement. Uh, and he became interested in musique concrète, and he had a one-track Wollensack uh, tape recorder in which he was engaging in the process of recording sounds and splicing tapes together to create compositions. Don was specifically a composer of electronic music, unlike Bob. Um, but, of course, this was just a one-track one tape recorder, which uh, even then was to some degree limiting and required a tremendous amount of cutting and splicing to get anything that you would want. Um, Don apparently, uh, I would love to hear it, but uh, Don apparently composed, for example, a musique en crête piece that was uh, the sounds of insects. It's an interesting pursuit. So, all of these culminating factors, the interest in human-machine interface, the physics background, the transistor background, and a musical, an electronic music background, converged at the point at which, in 1962, Don became involved with 
the San Francisco Tate Music Center. He became involved with it because he found out that the tape center had a three-track Ampex tape recorder allowing you to record multiple tracks of tape at a time, which presented a much greater opportunity for the creation of Lucy Concrete. So Don started to go there because he was allowed to use this recording device. <clears throat> Now, at the same time, uh, the founders of the San Francisco Tape Music Center were obviously interested in creating electronic music. We're talking about Pauline Oliveros and Morton Sabotnik and Ramon Sender, um, Bill McGinnis, who was hired. I'll get to that. Anyway, um, so they were interested in electronic music. And I've heard this anecdote, and now I'm starting to wonder if it can be, I don't know if this is a confirmed situation, but the story goes that um, Morton wanted a ring modulator. And so he went to the newly hired Bill McGinnis and said, can you make me a ring modulator? And apparently Bill uh, started looking for people to help him make this ring modulator. And so they put an ad in the paper for someone to do this. At the same time, Don Buchla, who had experience uh, in electronics uh, was coming there for to use the three-track tape machine and apparently he was mistaken by Mort as a person responding to this ad about building a ring modulator so Morton was like can you build a ring modulator and Don was like yes and then they were like okay um, if, if that's uh, a thing you could do can you do more than that could you make us an optical oscillator Oh, here is the, I believe, I, I don't know this is confirmed, but I think this is the three track there on the side. I don't know if that is true. I'll look to Brian and see if Brian says that's it. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see them all there. Um, so they asked Don if he could make an optical oscillator, which is uh, by basically having a light source and a photoreceptor and interfering with the light source, you can create wave shapes. So this is, he did this, he went home and he built this thing on a piece of plywood and brought it back to them and said, yeah, I can do this, but this is not remotely the way to do this. And so in further talks between Don and Morton, Don proposed creating a culmination of a number of things that were happening at the time and said, you know, I can create you an electronic music studio. And of course, and this is the crucial element, uh, it was a modular concept where, like the electronic music studios often use, they had, you know, an oscillator here or some sort of amplifier over here and they would connect them. Uh, this was the process, this was the idea of doing it modularly and taking individual components, putting them all together in a specific way, and then allowing the composer to connect them in whatever way that they perceived was necessary. And Don recognized that he could do this, that he wanted to do this. He had the transistor technology to sort of bring this concept into the modern time so it could be compact and useful as opposed to a bunch of disparate components in a room, et cetera. So he did this and um, basically he, uh, this was completed in late 1965, they were talking about it in 1964 and the 100 series. Not everything in this image was done in 1965, but largely that's when this unit was delivered. And it was a realization of Don's initial steps into creating a human machine musical interface. Um, and it's fascinating because there are two major things that need to be pointed out about this. Number one, he created a physical interface for the, the quote, playing of this instrument, which is the, the keyboard down at the bottom, which is not a keyboard. And amusingly, and this is one of those internet things, you'll hear people constantly talk about how Don didn't want to make a keyboard, that Don didn't make a keyboard, he created this touch sensitive device that would serve the same purpose. And it's interesting because that was actually, initially it wasn't designed to be like a generator of frequency, et cetera. It was initially 
to, uh, designed to be a way to control multiple tape machines at one time. So there were 12 keys on it, and the 12 keys directly controlled 12 different tape recorders. So the initial one, it wasn't even about whether you know traditional music keyboard or whatever, it was about controlling a specific device set. But then uh, these voltage generating keyboards were created by Don and um, still were uh, useful means of controlling the device he had created. Also, you might notice the sequencers in uh, that system. This is the Mills system. I took this picture at Mills, so this is the original one. Um, the sequencer. And this is one of the cultural things that really bothered me as I dug into this legacy was the notion that Don Buchla invented the sequencer so that we could have repeated notes. And that's true, but it's also not even true. It's a, it's, it's, it's a misunderstanding of Don's intention in creating the sequencer. Don, as a Musi contract composer, was very tired about the, the process of having, having to cut and splice tape. And if he wanted different sequences of sounds or frequencies or whatever, there had to be a better way to do it. And so Don literally used the, te the transistor technology that he had and his understanding of analog uh, devices to create the sequencer which allowed you to control the frequency of the oscillator or whatever in a sequence of ways in the same way that you would be splicing tape together. And that was the goal. It, the goal was to create a faster music concrete slash electronic music uh, outcome than the horrific, horrendous process of cutting and splicing tape. Now, of course, you can use a sequencer to create a sequence of notes or to repeat a sequence of notes, etc. But it's, it's kind of a crucial, if subtle, distinction that this was designed as a compositional tool for Musi Concrete. So that is what happened with the 100 series. And this is the point at which Don really came into, with the excitement of him creating this thing and its usefulness to composers like Mortzbani, it was a, an exciting verification to Don that his ideas about uh, creating a musical interface with a machine were valid. And he went on to refine this idea through a number of the devices that he has created, which I'm just going to shoot through really quickly here. Although I'll linger on this because this took a long time to make, so I feel like it, it deserves more screen time. It's actually, here's a secret, don't tell anybody. No one's recording this, right? Okay. Um, this is actually gonna be on packaging, Buchla packaging in the future. So you're getting a sneak preview. Don't tell my boss I told you. Okay. So we already talked about the 100, um, but I want to also address one little thing in the sense that, and Don proved this in his synthesis design, Don's intention was not, nor the intention of com uh, the engineers creating electronic music instruments in the 1960s. The intention was not to create an electronic sound. The, the intention, going all the way back to, to the turn of the century, was to be able to author sound, which is to say create sounds that did not sound electronic. Although we're all, and have been, excited by the weirdness of electronic music, electronic timbres, uh, the intention was also to be able to create anything, even sounds that sounded acoustic, uh, sounds that were not tied to the electronic nature, necessarily, of the device. Um, after Don licensed uh, the 100 series to Columbia uh, CBS in the late 60s, which apparently didn't go very well, uh, Don, I think in pure revenge, created the 200 series. Don had been able to look at his own designs and interact with composers like Mort, again, 
about how these designs could be more fine-tuned towards the compositional intentions and processes of the composers and how composers should interact with a device that creates timbre and performance in the way that his did. So the 200 series, um, if you're familiar with the differences between the 100 series and the 200 series, the 200 series is far and away more powerful than the 100 series. The 100 series be being actually pretty similar in design, like general design, to the mode modules at the same time. There wasn't this giant variation between those two concepts in the 60s, but whereas Bob's modular designs pretty much came to an end uh, when he sold RA Moog, although uh, Moog Music did create the more modern 1974 reissue of the modular, still, it was still pretty basically Bob's designs, whereas Don stepped up from that point and created much more complex devices, much more user-connectable devices uh, that were aimed at the composition of electronic music. And so the 200 series is uh, really fantastic. Um, one of the important things that Don did in this was he really considered about how the user would perceive the unit. And it occurred to him that in the 100 series, some of the knob patterns on the modules were repeated. So if a blind person, for example, were using this device, they may not be able to immediately discern which module they were touching. So he made a conscious effort in the 200 series to make each module have a distinctive pattern of knobs so it could be navigatable, perhaps by people who, didn't, who weren't looking directly at it or who could not see it. Again, a demonstration of his, his deep thought about the machine and the person using it. Uh, incidentally, I always have to point this out. This is the 237 keyboard that Don created uh, in 1970. And I'm a person who has spent a lot of time talking about how cool it was when modern synthesizers became polyphonic. And of course, the, 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 the synthesizer most typically described as like the first polyphonic synthesizer would be 1975's Mo Polymog, and that story is a fascinating, sto fascinating story. But as I dug into Buchla, I found the 237, which is a modular controller keyboard, and you'll notice that it is a keyboard, a traditional keyboard. Don designed things with traditional keyboards. The internet would say, no, he didn't. You stop saying that, it's wrong. That destroys the whole West Coast mystique. <laughs> Anyway, um, we'll get to my ranting about that later. Um, but this was a four, you could play four notes at a time and each of them had their own CV output and gate. So this was the first modern polyphonic synthesizer controlling keyboard. And no one ever talks about it. No one ever says that. And it's very weird to me. Anyway, so yeah, you can bring that up and someone will argue with you and say no, but it's true. So then we have, um, the, the, wait, the, okay. Um, in, I, I don't have the year on here, which is driving me crazy. Oh, 1971. In 1971, 1971, Don created the first hybrid synthesizer recognizing the importance of how a computer could help aid in the process of the interaction of the composer and the device. And the 500 series was that first device where a computer was actually used with his analog technology in order to uh, realize the goals of the composer. And this was constructed while on staff at Cal Arts. Um, the easel, yeah. which is, uh, certainly we at Mukla have a, a modern version of this and it's very exciting. Um, the easel is the most unique device. Don put a huge amount of planning and consideration into not only what functionality was there, but how it was laid out. Now, as a person who grew up in the, quote, Moog tradition, when I was first exposed to the easel, I was like, 
what, what in the world is happening here? It was very confusing. And I specifically said, why, why would you do it like this? This is the most confusing thing ever. And then after working at Mooclo, certainly my experience with the easel, I recognized my own like interface ignorance because I came at it with these expectations that it would behave like, like synthesizers behave. But Dawn designed it in such a way that it aids you in the compositional process that he expected through uh, electronic music, capital E, capital M, what you would want to do with these devices. And once you start to see his signature, his intention in the device, you start to recognize that everything that he did, he did very specifically for specific and really useful reasons. And once you get to that point, all of a sudden you're like, well, of course. And then you have an emotional, compositional experience with the device because you realize it's waiting, it's, it's connecting with you and it's waiting for you to do the thing that you would do. Now, of course, in this day and age, it's kind of confusing, like the experience I had to look at the easel because it is a, it's a strange layout. But within the context of electronic music and the time and Don's intentions, you can, you can see the blueprint of his creativity and his ability to understand how a human should interact with a device in the easel. Now, of course, there were very few of these initially made. I've heard 15. Uh, the 208 module, uh, more of those were sold. Uh, and now, obviously, Buchla produces these, and you can buy one. I'd like to encourage you to do so. <laughs> Can you give an example or two about compositional approach that you, these epiphanies you had? Um, for the easel specifically. In the sense that... Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Please. Oh, the question was, can I, can I list some compositional examples of how the easel sort of came to be, like the way that it compositionally is beneficial? Yeah. yeah. The way that... I initially, the concept like the low pass gate, which is a combination of a filter and a VCA, initially I'm like, that seems like a liability. Like if your, your filter and your VCA are forced to do the same thing, why would you ever do that? But it was a fascinating choice. And I think Dawn basically did it and was like, this is useful. So the, conceptually, it was not useful to me. And then once I started to interact with it and see what it sounded like to voltage control the filter, the six decibel per octave filter, and the VCA at the same time, it generates interesting and desirable tampers, that effect. And the more you work with it, the more you find yourself going, oh, that's really interesting. And it's not only it's not an electronic effect. It's not a thing that you listen to and go, ooh, that sounds so spacey or whatever. It actually has a really acoustic aspect to it. And when you listen to it, it's deceptively complex in uh, harmonics. And it makes a, 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 well, I mean, people call it the bongo, which I, I really like to, bongo? I mean, but it does, it can sound exactly like a bongo. And so, that, that architecture, which seemed foreign and strange to me initially, I'm like, well, now I know why he would do it this way. And certainly the whole wave folding thing, which I think was the first, uh, first implemented on the easel, uh, was a fantastic, bizarre, and interesting choice. And we're talking about 1973, like right in Minimoog era, Here's Don putting a wave folder on his portable, I'm sorry to say this, synthesizer. Um, because there was such a, a timbral uniqueness and opportunity and modulating the wave folding is so far and away in complexity and a possible outcome compared to the relatively, and I hate it when people say this, but I'm saying it for this specific context, relatively simple minima. And it's uh, certainly the sequencer. I said five steps, five? That's 
how could you, you can't come up with a, a five note melody is really boring and repetitive and I, I feel so stupid saying that now because if you're using the sequencer as a five note melody generator, yeah, that's gonna be really boring. But the sequencer isn't a sequencer, it, it's a stepped voltage output device that you can use to control a number of things and you can actually create incredibly complex outcomes with just those five steps. Don knew this and he saw this. So initially you're just like, but then once you see how those five steps can be applied as voltage control, the possibilities are massive and I still haven't even scratched the surface of it. So it's that sort of thing that is really interesting. So and it, it's, there's an efficiency to his design that makes it look too simple at times. But then once you start to explore how the different components interact, it becomes more evident that he had an intention. He basically said, here, I've laid this all out for you, but that's not what it looks like when you initially see it. It looks like he's this, you know. It's the weirdest metaphor ever. Thank you. Sir. So I have the arterial version, and I'm still at the early stage, and now you're helping me. Right, right. Uh, that's. I lost, I lost the real issue. That's, uh, yeah, we in Arturia kind of work together on that one. It's kind of like, you know, it's. Was I just about to make like a drug metaphor? That's terrible. But yeah, it's a gateway drug. <laughs> I'm sorry that we've, we've ensnared you in it. I understand and agree. <laughs> in 1973, uh, the 300 series came out, which was basically digital control for the 200 series modules. In 1978, again, I, this, would, this should probably get some sort of warning, a trigger warning covering it before I show it because Again, there was the creation of a keyboard-based Buchla device turning in the face of the common viewpoint. Uh, but uh, this was a eight-voice polyphonic synth with three oscillators per voice and was controlled by a digital uh, language called FOIL, which stood for Far Out Instrument Language. <laughs> it's, you know, you have to appreciate Don, his viewpoint, sort of, his sort of out there viewpoint wove through his technical genius, and uh, that's a lot of fun. I was, this was not working when I took this picture, which is sad because I would love to hear this device. I think there are some videos about it on YouTube. Um, and this, another keyboard. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, the 400 series, which was a digital device, uh, six voices of digital oscillators, it did FM, it did wave shape interpolation, it was controlled by the Midas computer language. And this was basically aimed at being a compositional tool, specifically a scoring tool, as at this time, uh, it was becoming evident that synthesizer type devices were pretty popular in films. So this is kind of the John Carpenter version of a book line. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> wow. Anyway, if you look at the keyboard on this, it is a really interesting realization of essentially the traditional keyboard archetype, but it's laid out in such a way that it's not immediately evident. Uh, but again, uh, very complex and designed specifically to allow the user to have a physical interaction with the device for the purposes of composition. Uh, here is the 700 series. This was the first MIDI Buchla device, which is interesting. Uh, it allowed you control of 190 acoustic variables. 12 voices, four digital oscillators per voice. Now, I can, oh, there, oh, and there were six modifiers per voice, 15 envelopes per voice, and the envelopes could have up to 96 breakpoints, which I read that and I was like, that's a typo. 
96 breakpoints. I mean, the complexity of that is desirable. So I, I feel like, you know, we should probably look in. We should probably bring this thing back. It looks so cool. Anyway, so that's the 700. Obviously, Don was continuously taking the new technology that he had access to and applying it to the things that composers would and now should want. If you look at the other devices being created at the same time by you know, standard synthesizer companies, the functionality was dropping to appeal to a wider <coughs> audience and the interaction was increasingly limited DX7, um, everything was on the downslope and aiming towards the general, like a more consumer base. Whereas Don was taking this increasing technology, the new processes, and still creating uh, a, a device that allowed a human performance, an expressive interaction with, that also provided the tools that a composer would need. Um, Thunder, which is, uh, well, it was kind of, basically it never, there were a number of them made, but it had some flaws that could have been addressed with technological progression. Um, but it was the first assignable MIDI controller, not based on a keyboard, but based on this, the sort of ergonomic hand placement allowing you to control a huge amount of variables at one time with your hands. So in a way, his complaints about the keyboard, which he did, he did complain about the keyboard, uh, described the keyboard as a, a good way to throw hammers at strings, but <laughs> not much else, which was, yeah. Uh, anyway, this allows you really a device that, like the keyboard, is ergonomically created for you, for you to interact with it based on your physiology, which uh, is really effective as far as performances go. And this device was an incredible performance concept, which uh, we now use in the Buchla 223E module. So you actually can still have this experience. And it is very complex and amazing and allows for an incredible amount of nuance because Don knew what the composer would want to do and created an interface that would do it. And then Don sort of stepped off into the, the stratosphere, really, with his, his concept like, okay, so if we, have, uh, if we have the ability to discern information uh, without even interaction, we, we should do this. And so Lightning works. It has two, basically, drumsticks that are sensed by the Lightning unit. And because of the way that the receptor, which is the black panel on the side, uh, sort of the way that it perceives space and the, the placement of the sticks, you can literally play different instruments within the space in front of you that are in different positions. There's an excellent performance uh, of Joel DeVell, who is our designer, implementing this where he's playing different instruments that are laid out in front of him, you know, xylophone and et cetera. And uh, Don would come in and take the instruments away. And even though the instruments weren't there, you could still hear, hear Joel playing them because they were actually uh, through lightning and were being sensed. And he, the, the instrument, the real instruments were actually placed in the spaces where the device was designed to send specific instruments. So at the end, he's still playing the same music and he's literally playing it with all the instruments are gone. Uh, so lightning, and what better way to sort of interact with an instrument uh, than the sort of the physical body interaction. And this is better than a theremin because um, there was a little more lenience in <laughs> the placement. But, uh, so the Lightning is a, an amazing device. And of course, next came the Marimba Lumina, which Joel helped uh, design. And it, the mallets have radio frequency uh, emitters in them. 
And so the device actually senses the radio frequencies of the individual mallets you use, up to four, and you can control it individually and it knows where the mallets are and what they're doing. It's really a fascinating device. This is the first version, the gold version, which is the pretty version. But it's also curved, which uh, xylophone and maroon players are not accustomed to like rotating. So it's kind of more of a challenge to play, but apparently it still works just fine. And then we get to Don's 2004 creation of the 200E system, which was a modern updating of the 200 design. Now in this, Don did a number of really interesting uh, modules intended again for the composition of electronic music as he perceived it, traditional electronic music. Um, which is funny because I don't think a lot of people, well I mean some, it depends on who you're talking about, but a lot of the people who want this device don't want it to create traditional electronic music, but rather a lot of the current popular subgenres. But Don really had the intention of you making art music with it. So like when I demonstrate a 252E, which is the one that has the circle and the, the rings, the multicolored rings that are so hypnotizing, it's not designed in the way that sequencers currently are designed to reproduce sequences of notes for, you know, basically techno performances. It's designed to create polyrhythmic, interesting, bizarre outcomes that allow you to create evolving compositions in real time. So it's, it's kind of a contrast to what the current movement is going towards. And also the current movement is going towards less and less physical involvement other than control uh, from the user. Whereas this was still designed for the user to have an interaction, a creative physical interaction with the device. And now every single module. So uh, this is a, a great demonstration of the performance, uh, a live performance, uh, in, well, actually I think it's a promotional photograph, but uh, so you see Don playing the thunder and the, the lightning is being played there and wind, which was never released, she's playing wind, which was a uh, performance interface that would appeal to uh, woodwind or brass players. So, the reason I have taken these specific uh, instances and aspects of Don's life and work is to portray the fact that his goal was and always was always intended to be that of creating musical instruments. He described himself as a maker of traditional musical instruments, which is a concept that if you look on the internet, the current modular craze, Eurorack, is not about a human playing a musical instrument. It's about a, you know, a person creating a complex studio outcome using a lot of technology connected together, if I can make that distinction. Don intended for you to physically interact in a traditional way with this equipment, as opposed to the current means of controlling equipment, which is basically acting as a technician at that music, at that, that equipment, creating you know, musical outcomes as a person who's operating those devices as opposed to, you know. So that distinction is really important and rarely discussed if you're in the morass of the internet. And also, my goal was also to continuously erode the East Coast, West Coast, metaphor, which I find is much more limiting than it is helpful because of when you, when you create, the, you've, you create teams, which is not the best way to do it because these two legacies, specifically Bob and Don, both have valuable things about them and valuable things that they got from each other. It was not a Tesla Edison sort of you know, but making it sort of, oh, East Coast versus West Coast, like it makes it into a, 
uh, adversarial relationship, which simply Bob and Don did not have. Although in the 60s, I heard it was, they were kind of, what's this guy doing? Anyway, uh, all of the various elements, of the, if you look up, and please don't do it, if you look up on the internet, what's the difference between the East Coast and West Coast? You'll get a list of the differences. Here are the differences. Buchla didn't use keyboards. Buchla didn't use filters. Buchla, you know, used additive synthesis. All three of those are completely wrong. Uh, because additive synthesis, although he did create the 148 module, which specifically deals with harmonics, which is awesome, but additive synthesis is not any time you add harmonics to something because a Moog, you know, modular, you can mix oscillator outputs, pow, you've got, you know, frequency modulation, you can add, you're adding harmonics any time you have more than one oscillator. So the whole concept of additive synthesis is something completely different to that. But people really want to be on a team. So they sort of, they find these differences that are vaguely true and hold on to them like they're totally true. And I want to fight that because I think the most interesting things about Don Buchla were not his idea that the keyboard didn't have to be the dominant thing. Um, and certainly Bob believed that too, which is the other weird thing. I mean, Bob created a whole slew of interesting interfaces for his devices. He wasn't bound to the keyboard, but it's convenient for people to portray him as that, to draw distinctions between he and Don, which I think is unhelpful from a historical standpoint. Now granted, what people are really talking about when they talk about East Coast, West Coast, is they're talking about what happened to Moog synthesizers in the 70s when popular musicians got a hold of them. And that's fair, because popular musicians really, I mean, well, Steve Horlick and certainly Suzanne Chani, but uh, popular musicians didn't latch on to Buchla and say, wow, I'm gonna use this in my bubblegum pop song. Although they should have, that would've been hilarious. But I mean, it stayed more of a traditional electronic music compositional tool, whereas Moog's work, not by his intention, but by simply what happened culturally, uh, became more of a popular instrument with diminished functionality, et cetera. Anyway, so uh, I could probably, get, I have an actual entire presentation on why the coastal metaphor should be let out to sea. Oh God, that was terrible. No, no, that, yeah. okay. Adam, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I take it back. I hope you won't resent my presentation for that terrible, terrible thing I said. But anyhow, that is, here's Don with a number of his creations. And if I may, I just want to say that um, there's, the Buchla history, especially since Don sold the company, has been tumultuous. Uh, but we are, Buchla USA, um, who bought the company a year and some months ago, um, are working very hard to embrace Don's legacy in the creation of this technology, and it's a hard and slow process because we want to do it right. We want the company to continue to embody the ideals that I specifically have you know, described in this presentation and respectfully move forward with his legacy. And um, so that's one of the reasons that I, I made this presentation is I want people to recognize that we're working hard to do uh, you know, to sort of follow, it's, it, it's awful to say, to do what Don would do, because no one can do what Don would do. It's impossible. But we want to be respectful to the concept of pursuing the spirit of Don's legacy. All right.